Spoilers ahead. Watch out, and take care. The movie begins in November 1941, in the USSR. A group of soldiers from the 316th Rifle Division of the Red Army are being briefed by a lieutenant, on the description of enemy tanks and weapons. A soldier named Ivan makes fun of the lieutenant during the brief, to raise spirits of the others. When the officer Vasily Klochkov observes this, he intervenes to excuse his actions. He then departs, leaving the others to continue discussing additional facts about their adversary, notably the weak points of their tanks. While the major commander is on the phone with the colonel about their current predicament, a soldier brings in some firewood. Later, dozens of bottles of alcohol are being prepped to be used as Molotov bombs, and Ivan is being requested to find more empty bottles with corks. He returns with a bag of it, and later, as directed, he obtains some construction supplies from the engineers, in order to build a scale model of one of the German tanks in the courtyard. As they wait for word from the commander at headquarters, a group of commanding officers discuss their next offensive action, emphasizing that it will be something unforgettable. As a few soldiers make some preparations, Officer Klochkov reads a news item about a Red Army comrade, Philip, who died a hero. Philip had intercepted a German anti-tank gun, smashing it with grenades, and killing numerous Nazis. While the men continue to work on building a wooden tank, a soldier asks if they have enough weapons for the offensive against enemies. The sergeant then warns him that they won't be able to engage the enemy in combat without reinforcements or additional weapon supplies, and instructs him to wait patiently within the headquarters, before making any moves. Commander Pavel describes the German attack force's deployment strategy, which consists of four tanks and three infantry divisions, some of which are located north of Moscow, and others in the western region. They try to prepare a difficult onslaught along Volaklamp's highway, arguing that the Nazis could avoid their anti-tank fortifications by deploying troops along the highway, to reach a road east of Yadriva. Their ultimate goal is to gain control of the roadway, and keep the whole opposing division on a single stretch. One of the lieutenants is concerned about losing the few men who will defend against three enemy regiments. The captain then says that such deeds are required until reinforcements arrive, but that it will be a guessing game where the Nazis will emerge from. As the Red Army prepares for their mission around dark, a woman hands an unknown item to one of the soldiers. Officer Klochkov makes a speech to improve the men's morale. He tells them that they will complete their goal, and go down in history as heroes of Moscow. After that, they wander off into the night in groups of four, telling stories of wars in Japan. Officers Klochkov and Grigori are ordered by the commander to keep an eye out for the 316th Infantry Division and the 50th Cavalry, while standing their position and staying alive. The men take up positions along the Volokolomsk Highway, and work tirelessly to dig trenches, before the sun rises. In the morning, Gabriel and another soldier, Ivan Chadron, construct a turret. Later, Captain Pavel inspects their trenches, and is pleased with the progress of their defenses. In the meantime, Kolchkov clarifies their use of the terms motherland and fatherland, the latter being the area where people live in by right, as their fathers before them. A soldier then disputes nationalism with him, hinting that anyone of any nationality can be a Russian, as long as they aid in the defeat of the Nazis. Some of the men notice a German plane in the distance while they are working. This prompts a soldier to take his rifle, and fire a warning shot at one of the planes, at which point Moskalenko joins him with his weapon. Yakov and Ivan transport 200 pounds of barbed wire from some sappers for their defenses. At night, Captain Pavel descends into the recently constructed trenches, in search of an underground base of operations. He receives a phone call from the Major, who informs him that the artillery commander will arrive at their area, and that more fire support will be provided as needed, which is fantastic news for the Red Army. In the middle of the night, the Nazi troops ready their tanks, and summon a fleet of soldiers to a spot. Anti-aircraft guns are also built, and they unknowingly send numerous rounds onto the battlefield. The Red Army waits calmly underground in the snowy trenches. As the fighting proceeds, Klochkov smokes a cigarette alongside Red Army commanders, reflecting on their current condition. The troops are forced to wait, as they see and hear tremendous weapon blasts coming from all directions, with only a few seconds between rounds being fired. Captain Gundilovich prepares his soldiers to commence fire on his whistle, as the German forces advance to their positions, bringing their tanks with them. Meanwhile, another commander orders his soldiers to hold fire, until they hear two rounds at the observation station. The officers in command take note of all the infantry and vehicles being used by the Germans in the direction of their convoy. The Red Army then launches a barrage of fire at the designated position, catching the German forces off guard, with some tanks being hit, and numerous soldiers fleeing for safety. Just then, German air support arrives, and Gabriel observes how easily they can run through their artillery positions from above. 
The captain then whistles as a signal to begin firing on their adversaries. Many enemy targets are destroyed, but as the tanks approach, the army's position is jeopardized, and they are directly blasted by tank blasts. The troops fight back with all the weapons and ammo they have left, using the trenches they dug to obstruct the enemy's line of sight. The Nazis retreat temporarily, while the commander orders his men to volley a few tanks, in order to utterly destroy them, resulting in a successful first run of defenses. The brief ceasefire allows the guys to unwind for a bit, while the soldiers smoke, remaining poised for battle. The rest of the troops resume their positions, and reload their weapons. One of the soldiers gets injured, and is brought away in a cart to the infirmary. Klochkov waves him goodbye, and assures him that everything is great, and that he did his job well. He returns to the underground base, and receives a call from the commander, who informs him that the attack was foiled, and that there were no losses other than a few injured soldiers. At the enemy's base, the Nazi soldiers reorganize and reload their guns for a second wave. At that moment, a German aircraft swoops down, and fires on the Red Army's position. Ivan Natarev attempts to return fire, but their adversary remains unharmed. A heavy barrage of gunfire begins, and the blasts have now reached the trenches' margins, forcing the men to shelter beneath, and converse amongst themselves to soothe their worries. Several of the individuals caught in the blast are being dragged to their man-made tunnels. Unfortunately, the onslaught of enemy fire makes this even more difficult, and they can only leave the injured and dead. The only way to stop the barrage right now is to destroy all opposing tanks. When the major commander returns to the headquarters, he attempts to contact the 4th Company, but receives no response. As the firing subsides, the Germans have completely decimated the trenches. The soldiers are able to crawl out into a dense cloud of smoke. The commander prepares his troops to counterattack, and Klochkov gathers others to assist with the injured bodies, which are then loaded into carts to be brought to the infirmary. As they attempt to repair communication, the enemy tanks resume and move to a new position. Finally receiving a signal, Klochkov requests reinforcements from the major commander, citing the fact that there are only 28 more troops left on the battlefield, each with a limited supply of weapons. Unfortunately for the Red Army, there are no more men to help them, and the major commander can only tell him to remain strong, and hold out as long as they can. With no other options, the remaining soldiers frantically search for the remaining ammunition and weapons. They split into three groups, each targeting one tank each. The sergeant then devises a strategy to buy them time, by convincing the Germans that they are all dead. The enemy forces come close enough for the Red Army to commence fire. The tanks immediately stop and open fire, causing extensive damage to the fortifications and killing two officers. A soldier approaches their position, takes up their anti-tank rifle, and successfully targets one of the tank treads, preventing it from moving. The others wait for a moment to strike, and when they do, enemy soldiers are brought down with nowhere to hide in the wide field. The rest fire grenades directly in front of the charging tanks, followed by RPG-40s to burn them down. Two brave soldiers keep firing, even when the enemy tank turns its gun on them, but they manage to destroy it. A soldier named Kasev reloads his rifle with the help of a comrade, and the two manage to shoot down the tanker. With more tanks immobilized, the men muster the confidence to keep firing and hurling grenades in the midst of the enemy's attack. They decide to let the tanks pass, and target the troops instead, since they are about to run out of ammo. A soldier fires an RPG-40, causing him to be shot multiple times, but he manages to survive. Barely alive, Klochkov hands him a rifle in exchange for the bomb, and he continues to fire at the tank, until he dies from his injuries. The German soldiers continue to close in on the Red Army, but they all remain defiant, using whatever firearms they have left. Imsov lands a direct hit on an opposing tank engine, rendering the vehicle inoperable. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the enemy lines, Kalinikov is the lone survivor of his defense line, and as he tries to aim the gun with his sights at the tank, he is shot and killed. The tank advances and effortlessly kills three soldiers. It moves through the trenches and along the walkway, heaping dirt and burying the fallen troops beneath it. Moskalenko is likewise blasted and buried, but he emerges from the earth with enough power to throw the RPG-40 at the tank, destroying it. He dies immediately after, yet his bravery allows him to save the rest of the men. Natara then grabs a Molotov cocktail, scales the tank, kicks the opposing driver inside, and burns him. As more tanks approach the positions, Klochkov and his troops flee for shelter, returning fire with rifles retrieved from fallen soldiers. He picks up a bomb, and launches it at an opposing tank, but gets injured from the blast. Klochkov then instructs a soldier to keep firing at the tank until it burns, however, the sergeant spots him, and they approach the enemy fire warily. Crouching for cover, a soldier loots a box of ammunition, but discovers that there is none left inside, 
so he improvises by throwing a rock to look like a grenade. He slows the opposing troops down, just enough for the remainder of the men to attach bayonets to their rifles and engage in close combat. A soldier clutches a shovel, and everyone remains silent as the enemies approach. A heavy fire cannon barrage wipes out most of the Nazi forces, revealing that a soldier believed dead had survived, and intercepted an anti-tank gun. The second unit of Nazi tanks waits for orders to advance from afar, but when their commander sees the aftermath of the initial assault, he tells them to fall back. With their retreat, the Red Army wins the operation, despite significant losses. The sergeant then commends his comrades for their actions, stating that they destroyed more than 50 tanks, making them heroes of their motherland. This novel is based on the amazing true story of 28 Red Army soldiers from the 316th Rifle Division, led by General Ivan Pinfilov. In the real world, monuments such as the Guards Memorial were built to honor the bravery of the 28 soldiers. The end. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. Turn on the notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out.